Have you ever been paralyzed by your indicators? Welcome everyone to Traders of the World, our new interview show where we bring inspiring stories about the financial market and incredible guests. I am Matheus Massari and with me I have Flavio Lemos. Hello world! Good morning, good afternoon or good evening, wherever you may be around the world. I'm Professor Flavio Lemos, Chairman of the Brazilian Local Chapter of CMT Association and also of some investment books. And we are speaking in English because we want to show inspire new traders like you around the world. I hope you all like it. Subscribe to our channel. I'm sure that our conversation with our special guest will be truly insightful. And speaking of our guest, today we have the privilege of hosting Tyler Wood, the Managing Director of the CMT Association. Flavio, do you know him for a while, right? When he's not in merchant markets, Tyler is hiking the mountains with his family or playing percussion for several bands along the east coast of the United States. He is also the co-founder of Go No Go Charts, a data visualization tool that simplifies market analysis to remove emotional bias from investment decisions. So please, welcome Mr. Tyler Wood. Hey guys, great to be here. Thanks for having me on the show. Thanks, Tyler, for joining us today. We really appreciate you taking the time for this interview. Are you okay. kidding, Flavio? You and I have been friends for so long, I wouldn't miss it for the world. Oh, thank you, Rob. <laughs> thank you again. Well, Tyler, let's begin. A fun fact for the audience. You told us at the CMT Symposium in New York about the concept of, of a word from Ghana called Sankofa. Could you explain that better for us and make a parallel to the life of a trader? But of course. Uh, so we got to see each other in April in New York City at the 50th anniversary symposium of the CMT Association. And one of the great joys that I have uh, working for this nonprofit is that I get to meet some of the founders, some of the innovators, the men and women of Wall Street and Bay Street and Dalal Street who've helped uh, create this discipline of technical analysis and educate the wider financial industry. Uh, one of the things that we did this year was we produced a history book on the 50 years of Wall Street and the creation of the CMT Association, Chartered Market Technicians. And so when we started the conference, uh, I went back to uh, some of the things that I learned in undergrad. I had a great ethnomusicology professor from Ghana. I have some family who lives in Ghana. I've been there many times and, and studied music there. And there's this concept from the Akan people called Senkofa. And it's represented by this Adinkra symbol that we see on screen. Now, you might notice that the bird is moving forward but craning its neck back around to retrieve that egg from its backside. So the, the parable or the phrase, se wo werefina wo senkofa a yenchi, it really is translated from tree into English to mean that it is not taboo to go back and fetch what you forgot. And so the meaning for all this to, to me and thinking about investors is that we can pay our tuition to Mr. Market, we can make lots of mistakes in our trading, and they can be very costly. Or we can talk to the folks who have done this through multiple market cycles, like yourself, Professor Lemos, who is teaching <laughs> folks some of, those, uh, some of those common pitfalls, some of the mistakes that we all make. And the power of this concept, Senkofa, centers around this, that to know the history and your heritage is to know your current self and the world around you. And that's the only way that we, uh, that we get better and, and make both a better place for all of us. So uh, that concept kind of uh, summarized for me what that 50th anniversary conference was all about, but also shows like this. Traders of the world are, are there to help share some of the heritage for where all these tools come from and what was created uh, by the generations before us that could give us some insights into what we can create for the generation to come. Since 2011, you have presented the tools of technical analysis around the world. So tell us about your beginning as a trader. From the start, what did you study? So uh, I certainly took a circuitous path into finance. And uh, a lot of the folks in technical analysis that I talked to uh, come from a similar background, which is not strictly finance. They didn't go into accounting. 
Uh, but we studied other things. So I, I did my undergraduate degree at McAllister College in St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, it was a wonderful four years, uh, a great interdisciplinary study. I took classes in political theory, political science, and in anthropology and sociology. Uh, I have to tell you that uh, I thought I was going to be a biologist. I really loved biology in high school, and I came to college and uh, realized that that was not the path for me. But I found a different path, and I studied music and, and liberal arts. And then uh, I joined my now wife in Indiana. She went to a doctoral program. Uh, and after auditioning for music school in LA and thinking about you know just pursuing music uh, out on, on the West Coast, we decided that uh, we were better off together. So I, I went to Indiana and that was where I did my MBA from the Kelly School of Business at Indiana University. And there's nothing against the, uh, the great professors that I had there, but it was very strictly fundamental analysis, corporate finance, managerial accounting, <laughs> macro and microeconomics. Uh, none of the professors really gave much attention to, or certainly not positive attention, to the field of technical analysis. So it wasn't until uh, 2010 when we moved to New York City and I found this organization, the Market Technicians Association of New York, MTA was the old name. Uh, and I met folks like Phil Roth and Louise Yamada and Ralph Acampora and uh, Bruce Kamick. And they were just so generous with their time to help me understand that what I had learned was how companies work. And if you're going to run a company or, or be a product line manager, or, you know, do, do that. Uh, those are very important tools to understand. But if you're going to trade in public markets, you're not buying the whole company. You're buying shares. You're buying stock. And so learning how the market works, uh, that was my next education or re-education, so to speak, through the CMT Association. And that started in, uh, in 2010. It was, uh, it's been an incredible journey. As Flavio said in the beginning, how could a trader avoid being paralyzed by a lot of indicators? I love that question. <laughs> you guys, uh, you guys know me well. Uh, and so, you know, I was actually watching the interview you had with John Bollinger, and he brought up this idea of multicollinearity, or you brought it up actually, Flavio. And the idea behind most technical analysis is that we want to be objective in our approach. We want to remove subjectivity. We want to remove a lot of the narrative or emotional decision making from our trades. So to do that as a technical analyst, we might look at a number of criteria, a responsible checklist for how we would identify trends. Uh, this gentleman, uh, John Henry, is, uh, is, is kind of a hero of mine, a great trend following investor, uh, ran the Boston University Endowment, also owns the Boston Red Sox and Roush Fenway Racing. Uh, he, the first time I saw his name was actually when I read the book Moneyball. And the idea there was taking statistics to inform player selection. And they put together championship winning teams for the, the Boston Red Sox baseball franchise by simply looking at player statistics. So if we apply that to the markets, and John Henry did that uh, quite effectively, first in the commodities business, uh, he started in, a, in a very humble beginnings in South Illinois on a soybean farm, learned the commodities trade, and then applied this concept of statistical rigor to investing at large. And his whole idea is if you can remove what you think you know or what you believe will be the case and just look at what's actually happening, you can react responsibly. So for all of us trend followers, it might start with you know simply visualizing you know whether a, a security or an index is moving in a general direction from bottom left to upper right, and that's that's great. You know, technical analysis started with very classical techniques, looking at uh, pattern recognition and, and price action, um, but this is still a little subjective, and it's really only useful in hindsight. We can identify that this was a trend once we get up here to the top right corner. Now, if we want to be more objective, we might apply something like Donchian channels, right? Uh, Richard Dennis, the, the famed uh, creator of the Turtle Traders. Uh, Flavio, you and I got to spend some time with Jerry Parker at the CMT conference. He's one of the original turtles and now runs Chesapeake Capital. Just a tremendous trend follower. Well, Donchian channels was one of the, uh, the first rules that Richard Dennis taught them for timing entries. And all they do is they look uh, a look back period, uh, striking new highs and higher lows. And, and you can be objective about 
price trending in an upward direction. This Dunchin channel is breaking up to the upside. So that's one tool. <clears throat> we have our visual analysis. We have some Dunchin channels. Of course, we're going to use moving averages, right? How is price performing relative to its uh, historical average? Well, if one moving average is good, maybe three would be even better. And you start to add additional <laughs> lines to the chart, right? I talked to some young traders, and they're not even just using three moving averages. They're using many, many more. Um, but you can start to understand that moving average crosses might give you some entry or exit signals. Um, and you can set your parameters around these uh, the periods of your moving averages and adjust things to your own time frame. Then you might also look at something like Bollinger Bands, which could be used to identify new trends at the break, at the expansion of volatility from a relatively narrow area. So here, Bollinger Bands are, are tightening, and then we see a break to the upside. Now, what Bollinger taught us was that two standard deviations from the mean should encompass about 95% of all the data in a normally distributed data set. We know financial markets are not perfectly normally distributed, but this is significant price action when it's pushing the upper band of the Bollinger Bands to the upside. That's a breakout for a trend follower. Well, then we can add something like volume, a confirmatory indicator. Does the market actually stand behind this new price rally? Are there enthusiastic buyers? And then, of course, we might look at a myriad of different other indicators like the MACD, the Moving Average Convergence Divergence, to give us a sense of momentum on those trends. The point of all of this is that this is a pretty small checklist, right? We're looking at you know, six different indicators, and we can see that somewhere in this region, there's an identifiable new trend. But where amongst these two months of market data do you make your trading decision? Right? When we have enough squiggly lines on the chart, we can convince ourselves of just about anything. And this is a, a very responsible, pretty simple chart. Uh, we've all seen the, the chaos that abounds on trading desks where uh, people add indicator after indicator after indicator. And the point that I, I want to make here is that the individual tools, creativity and ingenuity of the men and women who gave us these gifts, uh, that they're so powerful. And we want all of that information. So I'm not saying that Bollinger Bands are moving averages or stochastics or MACD. No, all of it is useful. But if we could do the computation in the back end and have a chart that is cleaner, that keeps our focus on price, our most important indicator of all, then we, we have less tendency to introduce those emotional uh, bias uh, to our process. And if you're like me, I'm a very emotional person. Uh, you know, if something is is working against me, I might be able to convince myself that oh, it hasn't broken all of my rules. You know, in my 15 point checklist, I'm only seeing 14 of those being violated. So maybe I want to <laughs> hold on to this a little longer. Or hesitating to get entry points. Right? You're waiting for full confirmation from everything, um, and that's what led us to uh, the idea of blending all of those tools into a trend following model and having a, a, a chart that's very, very simple and uh, elegant to look at. Profiler, how did you come up with the idea of creating your own indicator, your Bono Go charts? We did indeed. Uh, so I have a dear friend named Alex Cole, uh, who worked for about 16 years in the product development team at Bloomberg. And uh, he and I co-founded this company called Go No Go Charts. And it was that exact idea where one of the difficulties with technical analysis is that you, you want uh, a diversified uh, set of tools or metrics that you're looking at, but you don't want a cluttered chart. You introduce analysis paralysis, you introduce uh, confusion or subjectivity, you can bring back a lot of the emotions to the table that we were trying to eliminate to begin with. So what we have on screen is, is a go, no go trend. And the whole concept was, let's take all those powerful indicators, let's blend them in the background, and then just color code our chart according to that trend following model. So very simply, we have a, a, we've built some sensitivity in the model. So when we are in a go trend, when uh, you think about NASA launching a shuttle, is it go for launch? That means all the conditions are optimal. Everything in the background, the weight of the evidence is telling us that this security is trending to the upside. When it's in its strong form of the go trend condition, it's in blue. Weak form is in aqua. And then we see in a no-go trend, purple is a strong form downtrend, a no-go if you're a long-only investor. 
And then the pink is the weak form of that no-go trend. And you might notice here, Flavio, at, at these points of transition, we also have these amber bars. And that's when all of the criteria in the background are, are reaching their neutral territory, meaning the market is at a point of indecision. Buyers and sellers are in this tug of war. And so we have a, a neutral uh, reading in our trend following model. We're both uh, big fans of the life and work of Jesse Livermore. And his famous quote was, in markets, there's a time to go long, a time to go short, and a time to just go fishing. So we have go bars, no go bars, and go fish bars. And that's the, uh, that's the real basic uh, go, no go trend model. Nice. That's yeah. a really practical system, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> As a trader, do you look at fundamentals like account balance or the macro scenario? What else do you look at? So I think that uh, intermarket analysis is critical. I think that uh, even if you are an equity only investor, there's so much really you know, powerful information from the commodity space, from interest rates, certainly, and then from looking at, at currency relationships as well. Um, I don't spend a ton of time pouring over 10Ks or uh, reading analyst reports on uh, the fundamentals of the company. Uh, I, I do believe in a William O'Neill methodology, which is, uh, you know, he was the inventor of Pan Slim and multiple criteria that, that help us understand that there's a fundamental driver for these long term trends. I believe that markets uh, trend because of strong underlying fundamentals or expanding GDP that, that gives us these secular bull markets. Um, so I, I certainly look at the macro factors. I look at influences from uh, interest rates, from currencies, and certainly what's happening in the commodity space, but more as, a, as an exercise to understand the general condition and environment that we are in. When it comes to the individual security or the company, I'll be the first person to tell you that uh, as an investor, you can participate in semiconductors. Do I know the first thing about manufacturing semiconductors? Not at all. Do, you know, do, do I know what's happening uh, inside the management teams of, of regional banks in the US? Not at all. And did I do all of that hard work to understand the, the risk exposure from the bond holdings that those regional banks had at the end of 22 that led to their uh, uh, liquidity crisis in March of 23? No. But as a technical analyst, that stuff shows up on your charts. Right. You saw regional banks on a relative chart relative to the financial sector, relative to the index crater months before we actually found out that Silly Valley Bank and uh, Signature Bank were collapsing and, and being, you know, folding under. My point is that uh, is my co-host on Fill the Gap, David Lundgren, likes to say the greatest fundamental analyst in the world is the market itself. And so when those when the story finally comes out, it's usually after the trade has already happened. We we know later on why something was the case. And as human be beings, we always want to know the why. But if we can have a little faith in our tools and stick with our disciplined process, then we can participate in trends in any kind of market, even without doing all of that fundamental due diligence, because the market is is showing us uh, what's happening in real time. So, so please, Tyler, could you explain how Gono Go charts works? Do you have any indicators, special things inside or outside? Do you have any other uh, indicators that goes uh, together with the Gono Go uh, colorful chart? Um, other <laughs> Absolutely. I was, I was oh, give me some examples. <laughs> so we talked about trend identification. The, the next step for most analysts is to start thinking about the concept of momentum, right? And if we want a complete technical view, we should understand the trend condition. We should understand what's happening with momentum. We have to know volume. And then we also want to know volatility. I, I, uh, I have uh, pulled feet whenever I talk to the great John Bollinger. Uh, because he's, he was so creative in innovating uh, these, these concepts. Volatility was a fixed measure when, uh, when he first started thinking about Bollinger Bands in the late 1970s. It, it was inconceivable that volatility could fluctuate for a company. Uh, so 
momentum concepts uh we can we can cruise through this uh but we all know you know stochastics from george lane in the 1950s we understand the idea of confirmation and divergence of overbought and oversold we could look at something very simple like the rsi from wells wilder in the 1970s another range bound indicator that's going to give us uh you know a, a good reading on momentum we might even just look at a uh, money flow index to get an, a, a sense of you know a volume weighted rsi if you will and the list goes on and on and on. We can use lots of different momentum indicators to give us different uh, viewpoints on what's happening. Even something as simple as simple rate of change, right? Now, an unbounded indicator like this can go to extremes when you have something like the meme stocks. Uh, so your, your information from these different indicators is gonna change based on the environment that you're trading in. And uh, Commodity Channel Index is another great tool that uh, we certainly want to pay attention to. The problem is we can't add all of these panels to our chart, right? This is the go-no-go -no -go chart with these uh, six simple momentum oscillators. Well, we don't want six panels because now price action is almost indistinguishable. So what we did with go-no-go -no -go charts was the same idea, blending multiple concepts in the background, and we get a complete chart that looks like this. So we have our trend model at the top, uh, we can understand direction and strength of the security or the asset class or the sector that we're looking at. But then we also have a single oscillator that's going to give us the, the viewpoint that all of those momentum oscillators do, but in a simplified way. Ours ranges from negative six to positive six. So already the, the overbought and oversold levels are easier to pick out. We also did something a little unique, which is we don't want a, another histogram on our chart. We incorporated volume right into the oscillator. So where it's dark blue, we have heavy relative volume. Where it's light green, we have light volume. And then the other most important part of this oscillator, if, if you've read the works of people like Connie Brown and others who have uh, really understood how we could use momentum oscillators in a trending environment, right? Keep in mind, Wells Wilder created RSI in the 1970s. 1970s US equity markets were in a, in a range bound choppy mess. So, of course, investors using his tool started thinking, oh, great, it gets to overbought, I'm going to sell because the market is going to mean revert. Well, what if you're not in a range-bound mess? What if you're in a strong, trending market? You can still use momentum oscillators to your advantage. In go no -go charts, what we want to think about is momentum uh, racing off into overbought levels and then coming back to neutral. When we're in an uptrend, as you can see, let's zoom in on this part of the chart. When we are in a go trend, when we're trending upward, momentum is going to surge positive and then come back to neutral and test this objective zero line, that amber line in the middle. And if it finds support there and surges back in the direction of the underlying trend, that's where as trend followers, we can really press our bets. And I, I've got a funny story about, uh, about momentum oscillators. Uh, Ralph came into the CMT office early on when I when I first started working there. And of course, he's he's such a wonderful, lovable human being. I wanted to impress him. And so in, in our library, we had the these walls covered with Ralph's hand-drawn charts from his uh, chart room back in the day. And I said, oh, Ralph, right there, RSI is overbought. There's the uh, sell signal. He said, oh, Tyler, 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 sit down, son. Let me Let me teach you a thing about momentum. And Ralph said, here's how I want you to think about momentum. Imagine there's a baseball in your glove. You know, Ralph's from the Bronx. Everything's baseball with these guys. <laughs> You've got a baseball in your glove. When you throw that ball in the air, that's the fastest it's going to move, right? The velocity, the momentum of that ball is fastest the moment it leaves your hand. And then it's going to travel up to the apex, right? The highest point where you've thrown it. And it's going to keep going up, but it's going to go up more slowly meaning your momentum reading is, is higher, uh, it's, it's making lower highs, right? It's decelerating, it's exhausted. And it's gonna come back and what do you do? You catch it in your glove. And the game of catch continues as long as you catch it in your glove. So coming back to go no go charts, that zero line, when we're in a strong go trend, momentum is gonna surge positive, but it's gonna come back to the zero line, to neutral. It's not gonna go oversold, if it does, that's a direct threat. That's a, a strong divergence from what we're seeing in the trend behavior. That, that implies excessive 
selling uh, or, or negative momentum for that security. So if we catch the ball, unlike me, Butterfingers over here, if you catch the ball in your glove, the trend can continue and it will surge and come back to neutral. And it's folks like Connie Brown and uh, Art Cardwell, uh, Andrew Cardwell, excuse me, who have written about how we could think of momentum oscillators in trending securities and trying to define those ranges. But again, with most momentum oscillators, it's a very subjective methodology. So we make a, an objective zero line and you can see right on the chart where it comes back to find support and then the trend continues. Uh, so that's that's a more of a complete go, no go chart and a view on uh, momentum, volume and volatility. What is your current view about the markets where big techs are outperforming the small caps? So from an asset allocation perspective, I mean, we pay attention to the Morningstar nine style boxes. So you have uh, growth versus value, large cap, mid cap, small cap, and the blends therein. Um, Certainly, we have seen large outperforming small in this in this recent rally and growth equity sectors, information technology, consumer discretionary and communications in the US uh, stock market have been leading. But let's not forget about energy, which is also in the leadership group. And earlier on this year, we saw that rotation into cyclical sectors like industrials, even materials and financials. Right. Remember those bank collapses we were talking about in March? <laughs> Financials were leading over the summer. So uh, I keep a very close eye on rotation through the sectors, but we also take a, a, a very close look at uh, style allocation as well. And with a lot of our uh, institutional clients, they're wealth managers and they're, they're running fairly, um, uh, what, what would be common to the technical community, tactical asset allocation models. They wanna make sure that their sector bet is right and that they're overweighting the relative strength leadership. So relative to the s p 500 you look at those sectors within the sectors you can look to the industry groups and here's what i'll say about small caps we uh we had a recent interview with uh with a great technical analyst on fill the gap the uh, cmt podcast we we're looking at the chart of the russell 2000. now there's a lot of resistance at at 2000 uh and we've struggled to get above that uh that price level but we've had this series of higher lows throughout uh, throughout the last several months. I mean, it's it's almost a year long ascending triangle pattern. So I haven't forgotten those lessons from Edwards and McGee about how important it is to see price patterns as an expression of what's going on from investor behavior. So yes, there's a there's a supply, there's resistance at 2000, but we're seeing those series of higher lows, meaning that buyers are stepping in at higher and higher price points on a small cap index like the Russell 2000, where there's more and more demand eating up. And so it's not selling off, it's it's simply basing out. And uh, I'm, I'm very I'm very bullish on uh, what, what seems to be a very constructive setup to this market. It's not surprising to me that here in September, we've seen some of the very largest uh, names roll over like Apple. Um, but if you look at a, a weekly chart of Apple, We've simply come back down to what was a resistance line in uh, the end of 2022. It's now support in 2023. That's that polarity principle, uh, a core concept for technical analysts. And so as long as we're above that, uh, that support line, what was resistance last year is now support. Uh, it, it seems like a pullback within an otherwise uh, larger term secular uptrend. So I don't think the story is over for uh, large cap tech names like Apple. Uh, but certainly it makes sense for them to to take a pause. And, you know, we're seeing that rotation in terms of leadership into other sectors of the markets. Right now, energy is uh, is is the the leading lady, so to speak. Um, and it's nice to see that uh, that rotation take shape because we can't uh, we can't have a raging bull market unless there's more participation. Uh, we want to see breadth expansion and all of that. Uh, so. So, yeah, that's what I would say about uh, large versus small and uh, style groups. It's health for the market uh, other other companies participate. If there is no not just Nvidia at the market. There is another <laughs> five thousand names in the market. You so, know what you make a great point there, Flavio. in a cap weighted index like the S P, some of these 
extremely large names. If if they're not uh, uh, trending upwards, then the index can't really go anywhere. So as investors, we, we have to know that it's a market of stocks, not a stock market, and start to diversify our holdings and look to individual securities or industry groups so that we are capturing those things that are relative outperformers and not just uh, passive index holders, as uh, many, many fund managers have become. Tyler, do you consider yourself a uh... Trend follower, trader, uh, swing trader. What's your personal style as a trader? What's your personal trader's routine? Uh, so let me first declare that I might be the world's worst trader. Uh, <laughs> I do not pride myself on my historical track record for trading individual securities. Uh, with with our family, uh, and given how busy life is, I have a very simple tactical asset allocation model. Uh, I use go to go charts in everything that I do, um, but I'm just rebalancing uh, weekly based on relative strength leadership. And then, and that's for the equity side of the portfolio. I have some longer term uh, holdings that are uh, maybe more thematic based, and that's uh, that's largely driven by you know the intermarket work and uh, and some broad themes. So uh, so I. I keep uh, I keep my trading to a minimum. Uh, when when I did attempt the very short term work, uh, you know, gave me gave me great stress and anxiety, and uh, I made all the behavioral mistakes that everybody makes. So I found that longer time frames, sticking with the trends that are working, and uh, and a much more simple uh, asset allocation technique is is better for me. And I'm a happier husband. <laughs> 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 but buy and hold is a trader it's not a strategy so it's okay no problem you know buy and hold uh that that is what i learned in uh, in graduate school and and what i have heard so many fund managers uh i mean they pound the table that that's the way to do it the problem is uh those once in a lifetime events uh they've happened three times in the last 20 years so if you're a portfolio manager and you tell your clients we're, we're, we're a buy and hold strategy, we just you know we're just going to get into something and we're never going to let go. Well, three times in the last twenty years, those clients have been cut in half. I mean, to me, that's malpractice. <laughs> that's worthy of uh, of some uh, disciplinary action from uh, from clients to PM because. What else are they paying you for if not to take an active approach and protect their downside risk? Uh, so those once in a lifetime events seem to be happening uh, a little more frequently than the buy and hold folks would like to admit. And Tyler, could you tell us more about how to become a CMT charter holder? Absolutely. So uh, this this organization is uh, is near and dear to my heart. Uh, the CMT program itself is open to anyone uh, that's interested in learning technical analysis and a responsible approach to these tools. Uh, I'll tell you, there is a lot of content out there about technical analysis. Uh, but when the organization first started in the late 1960s, there was this environment, they called them tip and clip clubs. So predatory broker dealers were trying to give clients this get rich quick schemes and they were saying that was technical analysis. And in 2020 and 2021, we saw a lot of, you know, TikTok traders coming out with uh, very silly schemes. We, we saw SPACs explode, the cryptocurrency craze, the meme stocks. Everybody was trying to make, uh, make a quick buck. Well, that's irresponsible. And so the CMT program was set up to differentiate, to create a, a rigorous standard of competence and ethics in financial markets, and it's for professionals. So anybody can come in and uh, sit for the exams. In fact, we have a very robust academic partner program. There are university students all over the globe uh, who are learning these tools and, and sitting for the first levels of the exam. But to be a chartered market technician, a CMT charter holder, you do have to have professional work experience and, uh, and be a contributing member of the financial services industry. Um, it's three levels of exam. And this is your level three textbook. It's pretty robust. It's about 1,200 pages. And it's a lot of hours of study. Um, and uh, getting through the exam process, uh, what I found, certainly a lot of hard work. But comparing that to some of the other subjects that I've uh, studied in my life, this is so practical. Like you finish a chapter that night, you've uh, you've taken some notes, you've got ideas in your head, and the very next day 
you can put them into into action. You can see it happening right in front of you on your charts, as opposed to some of the accounting classes that I took in, in college. First of all, you're waiting for quarterly data reported by the companies, and then it's often restated after the fact. Uh, you can't always believe what the companies are telling you, circa Enron or uh, uh, you, you name your financial collapse. But what I what I have found with the CMT program, besides being so practical, is that uh, it's a real career benefit. So we survey all of our charter holders, and we've looked at you know what they have gained a year after earning their CMT charter. A lot of them have new positions; they've been uh, recruited away from their current firms. But over 60% reported having increased responsibility, which for a portfolio manager, what that translates to is assets under management. So either the firm is allocating more capital to them or clients are bringing more money to work in their fund because they believe that that person, having earned the CMT designation, has a defined, repeatable process for managing risk and capturing reward. Uh, and I, uh, I can't encourage people enough. Obviously, I'm biased. But uh, for me, the CMT program, even after being around technicians for years, uh, I found that the breadth of topics covered really opened my eyes to other areas of the market that uh, that I wasn't currently incorporating into my discipline, into my practice. And uh, it's a really it's a really powerful program. But of course, the learning doesn't stop just with the exams. Uh, our membership around the world engages in continuing education uh, all over the place, like the symposium and our webcasts and journal publishing and magazines and you name it. We, we produce a lot of content and try to keep everybody on that cutting edge of uh, where the discipline is headed. So more information is at cmtassociation.org. So, Tyra, besides being a CMT charter holder, what advice would you give to younger trainers? Also, could you suggest some good books? Yes. Uh, so I would tell everybody in their youth to make as many mistakes as possible and get really comfortable with it, right? Investing is not about being right. It's about making money. And so the sooner you can grasp the idea that um, the market is, is there to make a fool out of as many people as possible, the, the sooner you can understand that there will be trades where you are wrong and you need to get out. Uh, the better you will do long run. Um, and, you know, people think that's crazy. Uh, when I talk to university students, you know, they're, they're all trying to get the A on their paper. They're all trying to, you know, impress the professor. And so they're terrified of failure. And I think that's, I think that's really dangerous. Uh, think about baseball. When, uh, when a professional major league baseball player bats 300 throughout their career, we put them in the Hall of Fame and children go around carrying their, their trading card and wearing their jersey. Well, batting 300 means they strike out 70% of the time. Well, they strike out 70% of the time and they're the best in the world. And so when you talk to these trend following investors like uh, David Harding at Winton Capital or Jerry Parker at Chesapeake or, or Paul Tudor Jones, they love their losing trades. They're looking for them all the time. They embrace their losing trades because they want to get out of them as quickly as possible. They they admit that they're not always going to be right. And I think the sooner we get comfortable with that, uh, the better off we will be as investors. It's certainly okay to be wrong. It's just not okay to stay wrong. Uh, and then you asked about books to read. Uh, I certainly think everybody should pick up the CMT Level 1 curriculum, regardless of whether you sit for the exams. It's a great, broad overview of uh, basic terminology, basic concepts. Uh, but I've loved... The Market Wizards books by Jack, back, Jack Schwager. Uh, those personal stories are, are just incredible. I would encourage everybody to pick up a book by Andreas Klinau, uh, who's written at length about systematic trend following and CTA industry. Um, and then I would say, you know, Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow. If you want to understand sort of the, the human psychology component, the behavioral side of investing, uh, that's a great read as well. Um, and for those who are thinking about, you know, sort of asset allocation and all that, uh, Mebain Faber, Meb Faber is a CMT, uh, and he's written a lot about the Ivy portfolio and global asset allocation, and those are all really great reads as well. Jack Schwager was here with me in 2004, and mm -hmm. he made a great presentation with Steve Deason too. So I know him personally, and I and I knew Clino uh, this year in New York. He's mm -hmm. He has a wonderful uh, trend follower 
books, huh? he's the, like a, the, the Bible of the Brandy Pauling and his books. He is a very so, prolific author, as are you, Flavio. So I will tell everybody who's watching Traders of the World, if you are Brazilian, you got to pick up a book by uh, Professor Flavio Lemos. See oh, thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. My kids, we are pleased for this. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Tyler. In 2022, in Washington, D.C., you told me to get on stage and make a presentation with, all, with no preparation at all. And I said, okay, I will do that to give me a beer on the stage. And it did. And I did the presentation. So now it's my time to end with a grand finale. Could you play some drums for us? Uh, how, how did I know that uh, that little stunt was going to come back to haunt me? Uh, and by the <laughs> way, you and uh, Eric Conrad and JC Peretz and Akshay Chinchalkar did an incredible job because it, with the language of technical analysis, it, it, it doesn't require uh, you know hours and weeks and months of preparation. You can have a sensible uh, commentary on any market worldwide just by looking at the chart, because the tools are the same, whether you're looking at a, a weekly chart of the S&P 500 or a one minute chart of, uh, of GameStop, uh, you can apply the tools in the same way. So, uh, a, a plus to you, Flavio, for, uh, for taking the challenge. And I guess it is my turn. Uh, I, I, thought, I thought maybe instead of uh, banging on my loud drums, uh, you, know, you brought up the, the concept of Sankofa. So Flavio, I spent a lot of time in college working with an ethnomusicologist named Soa Mensa. And uh, Soa is from Ghana and he taught us lots of different music. Uh, this instrument is called the Jil and it is from Northern Ghana, from the Dagara people. Uh, they play this welcome song at social events uh, as people are coming together as a way to uh, bring about that festive spirit. Uh, so here is the welcome song played on the geo. To see the side of your talent outside of the finance world we truly appreciate your sharing you sharing this part of your life with us thank you very much you know i found trading can be very stressful it can occupy too much of your mind you have to step away from the chart sometimes and, and do something where you're concentrating elsewhere and for me that's music and we come to an end of this incredible interview with tyler wood
We want to thank you all, our viewers, for joining us on this journey. We also want to say thank you very much for Mr. Tyler Woods for sharing his history and outstanding achievements with us. We hope that Tyler's dedication and success serve as an inspiration to many trainers around the world. Thank oh, you guys so much. Thank you very well. We will see you whether in Brazil or New York or Dubai very soon. So thank you everyone and we'll see you in the next interview.